everyone, my name is Dr. Omende and I'm going to discuss the development of the cardiovascular system and in this lecture series I will focus mainly um, on the heart. So um, the objectives of this study or this uh, presentation, so these are the objectives of um, this lecture. You can just pause and have a look at the objectives. So we go straight to um, the lecture. So this is the embryonic timetable of development of the cardiovascular system. And of note is that cardiogenic plates are formed by day 20, endocardial tubes by... So the cardiogenic plate um, forms by day 20, and the endocardial tubes by day 21. And by um, week 5, or 30 days actually circulation um, begins. So um, the cardiovascular system is the first system to function in an embryo and circulation, uh, blood begins to circulate during the third week. Now, why do we need blood to be circulating this early? The embryo needs nutrients, yeah, and oxygen, and it needs to dispose metabolic waste products. So you need to set your circulation early enough so that the embryo can grow. And remember, immediately after birth, the child starts breathing. So the cardiovascular system has to develop, start developing quite early so that by birth, it's um, efficient enough because you are going to cut off the placental circulation and initiate the pulmonary circulation. So after birth, which is the postnatal period, the lungs have developed. But now we have complex requirements of the body because you have to pump blood throughout the whole body and the blood has to pass through the lungs. But in utero, the heart must adapt to the poorly developed lungs and its vasculature. So what happens in utero? You have shunts that allow the uh, blood to pump through the heart chambers and bypass the underdeveloped pulmonary vasculature. So where do this primitive vasculature come from? We have what you call angioplastic tissue that comes from the mesenchyme around the yolk sac. And the process of forming blood vessel is what we refer to as angiogenesis. Where do the heart tubes come from? At day 19, we have a pair of cardiogenic codes. This developer, the cardiogenic region. Where is the cardiogenic region? This is a zone of splanchnopleuric mesoderm that is cranial and lateral to the neural plate. Remember, the neural plate is what will give us the brain and the spinal cord to form neural tube that will give us brain and spinal cord. So the, at the cardiogenic region, the cardiac progenitor cells will actually, um, you know, aggregate together and these progenitor cells are within the epiblast yeah lateral to the primitive um, so these cardiac progenitor cells at the cardiogenic region they form what you call a cardiogenic code yeah so it's just a long like a cylindrical structure of cardiac progenitor cells and these are coming from the splanchnopleuric mesoderm so the codes now canalize so they become hollow and form endocardial heart tubes and at the third week, so now remember you have a pair of cardiogenic codes right and left. At the third week, the cranial and lateral fold of the embryo yeah, brings the two lateral endocardial cube, uh, tubes into the thoracic region. So you have right and left tubes. When the embryo is folding lateral, lateral fold of the embryo, you bring them into the thoracic region. And even the cranial fold moves this cardiogenic area or the heart tubes that are forming from the portion that is cranial to the neural plate to come to the thoracic region and they meet at the midline. So the two endocardial tubes fuse to form a primary heart tube. So this is what we are saying. This is the epiblast. These are the cardio cardiogenic cells that are lateral to the primitive um, streak. Then what happens? This is your primitive streak, primitive node here. This is the neural uh, uh, plates that has formed the brain plate and these are the angiogenic cells cranial to the neural plate and then this is your neural plate again and here you can appreciate the angiogenic cells in the splanchnopleuric mesoderm okay so the cardiogenic field <clears throat> you when you have the pharyngeal endoderm that the, remember the pharynx is forming so we have pharyngeal endoderm that induces the splanchnic mesoderm to form cardiac myoblasts and 
within the cardiac myoblast, there is appearance of blood islands. And these islands usually unite to form endothelial lined tube that's surrounded by. So the splanchnic um, mesoderm are induced by pharyngeal endoderm to form cardiac myoblast. And you have the appearance of the blood um, islands around them. And the islands usually unite to form endothelial lined tubes that are uh, surrounded by myoblasts. And that's actually the cardiogenic region. So when you have the tubes that are surrounded by myoblasts, forms the cardiogenic region where the heart will develop. So endothelial lined tube that forms the inner part of the heart and the myoblasts will form the um, cardiac muscles. So we have two processes that are responsible for the positioning of the heart. Number one, there is the cephalocaudal uh, folding of the embryo and there's the lateral folding. And these are going to move the heart from the cardiogenic zone that is uh, cranial to the neuroclete to come to the thoracic region. So this just shows the craniocaudal folding, okay? So initially, that's where the heart is, cranial to the neuroplate, but with the folding, you can see the heart is brought towards the, the thoracic region. Then with the lateral folding, you have two tubes, and as lateral folding occurs, as you can see here, if you're undergoing lateral folding, then you bring the two tubes together, that occurs at day 19 within the third week. The endocardial tubes have formed, so there are two tubes. And with the lateral folding, what happens? The two of them fuse, okay? So that you have one single heart tube. So the fusion of the two heart tubes, yeah? What happens at the point of fusion? We have apoptosis that occurs. Programmed cell death occurs at the contact surfaces and the atrial and ventricular myocardial tissue usually arises from the splanchnopleuric mesoderm, which we have already said the myocardium will come from splanchnopleuric mesoderm. And the outflow tract of the heart will ha uh, uh, usually have different cellular origin, where the endothelium arises from the cephalic, paraxial, and lateral uh, mesoderm in the region of the otic placode. So <clears throat> the myocardial tissue of the atria and ventricle come from splanchnopleuric mesoderm, while the endothelium of the outflow tract come from the cephalic portion of the paraxial and lateral mesoderm in the region of the otic placode. Then we have major cells um, in the wall of the outflow tract usually come from the cranial neural crest. Okay, so from mid otic placode to the caudal end of the third somite, they come from the cranial neural crest, while the endothelium um, of the outflow tract comes from the cephalic, paraxial, and lateral mesoderm around the otic placode. But from mid otic placode to caudal end, they come, the outflow tract will come from neurocrest cells. So what determines the position of the heart? We've talked of folding. So with the head fold, the heart and the pericardial cavity come to lie ventral to the foregut and caudal to the oropharyngeal membrane. So the heart is below the, <clears throat> the mouth. Then the tubular heart usually elongates after it has elongated, it develops dilatations and constrictions. Then the heart tube actually forms in the left third week, and you have right and left that are symmetrical. But after dextral looping, you now have the first asymmetrical structure appearing. So dextral looping will make it asymmetrical. Cephalic portion usually bends ventrally, caudally, and to the right. So the cranial portion <clears throat> of the heart tube will move ventrally, that's forward then moves downwards, caudally, and towards the right. So ventrally, caudally, and to the right, while the atrial portion will shift dorsocranially and to the left. So this are the right and left heart tubes. They fuse, you have apoptosis occurring here. Then this is the tube, and the first portion is called the truncus arteriosus, followed by bulbar codis, followed by primitive ventricle and the primitive atria, and that's at mid week three. Again, this is the bulbar um, codis, okay, that forms most of the right ventricle and part of the outflow tract. Then you have the primitive ventricle that will give you the left ventricle. You have the primitive atria that will give you anterior part of the right and left atria. Then you have your right horn and the left horn. These are coming from the sinus venosus and they will give the superior vena cava and part of the right atria. So this is just what happens, okay. We said the uh, cranial uh, part will move ventrocaudally and to the right, while the atrial portion will move dorsocaudally and to the left. So this is what you call the dextral looping. So 3D view, 
you can see the heart tubes and that's what you call dextral looping so dilatations and constrictions will occur then you have the cephalic portion will moving ventrally <clears throat> and to the right then the eventual eventually that's what you form after the folding and the dextral looping of the heart so if the looping occurs in the opposite direction you can see what has happened dextrocardia instead of the heart being on the left you have it on the right side then that's what we are talking about here dextrocardia is when the heart lies on the right side of the thorax instead of the left because the heart loops to the left instead of to the right and it can occur in what you call side two inverses where all the organs in the body are in the opposite direction like the liver now instead of being in the right it's mainly on the left so that's side inverses where you have abdominal organs and thoracic organs being affected then circulation within the primitive heart what happens at day 22 you can actually perceive contractions of the heart and this comes from the muscle so the atria and the ventricle usually are continuous initially then we have these contractions that are peristaltic and begin from the sinus venosus. So sinus venosus is receiving blood from three sources. So the embryo brings blood from the embryo through the cardinal vein, then from the developing placenta via the umbilical vein into the sinus venosus, and from the wall of the aortic sac via vitelline veins into the sinus venosus. So we have these three veins that are bringing blood to the sinus venosus, the cardinal veins, Ubilico veins and vitelline veins coming from the yolk sac. Blood from the sinus venosus, where does it go to? It has arrived in the sinus venosus, it will now enter the atrium to the sinoatrial orifice. And this sinoatrial orifice is usually guided by sinoatrial valves. These sinoatrial valves, they will fuse cranially and produce a marked projection, and that's what we call the septum spuria. Okay, so from sinus venosus, Blood car enters the atria through sinoatrial orifice that's guarded by sinoatrial valves, and the valves fuse cranially to form the septum spurium. Then, after that, we need to partition the atrioventricular canal. So, how do we partition the atria and the ventricles? This begins at the mid fourth week and is completed by fifth week, and you have three processes. First, you have to partition the atrioventricular canal. After that, you partition the atria so that you divide right and left. So basically, you first partition the atrioventricular canal. So you have right atrioventricular canal and the left. So you partition the heart into two canals. Then you now have to se separate the left from right atria and separate the left from the right ventricle. Okay, so how do you partition the atrioventricular canal? So the atria is partially separated from the ventricle by formation of bulges. And these are the endocardial cushions. So you have the heart chamber. But from the dorsal wall and from the ventral wall, you have endocardial cushions that will develop. Okay. Then two additional lateral cushions usually appear at the left and at the right borders. So the cushions now transform into dense connective tissue, which form dorsal and ventral walls of the atrioventricular canal. So as they grow into the canal, so the dorsal one grows into the canal, the ventral one into the canal, and the two of them meet remember they are, are are at the center of the heart chamber so when they meet this heart chamber is now divided into a right atrioventricular canal and a left atrioventricular canal so this is the heart chamber from the ventral wall you have the ventral endocardial cushion and the dorsal endocardial cushion but we still have lateral cushions that on the lateral aspect but what happens the ventral and dorsal approximate and come towards each other and eventually they fuse so this chamber now has two, two canals, the right atrioventricular canal and the left atrioventricular canal. After you've developed your atrioventricular canal, now we need to partition the atria. So what happens? From the upper portion of the heart, we have a downgrowth, and it's a first downgrowth. So it's the primary septum or the septum primum. So this downgrowth, okay, this is what we are referring to, from the roof, we are having a downgrowth that is coming towards the endocardial, where the endocardial cushions uh, are meeting. Okay, so <clears throat> this <coughs> septum primum, <clears throat> it will get towards the endocardial cushion, but before it gets there, there'll be a space, and that's the foramen primum. So this is the foramen or ostium primum. So as it's getting towards the endocardial cushion, there's the foramen primum, and it keeps coming down and down and down until when it meets the endocardial cushion. 
But before 